Hello and welcome to the session in which we will discuss related party transaction and another related topic to it is the imputed interest between the related parties. Now related party transactions falls under the umbrella of disallowed losses. So certain losses that we cannot use. We have certain losses that can be deferred, which we'll talk about later, and we already discussed certain losses that can be deferred, for example, in a qualified 1031 exchange. However, when it comes to related party transaction, we have to understand the rules because simply put, the losses are not allowed. Now, we have to also keep in mind that related party transaction is covered in the financial accounting and reporting. So you need to know what related party is for financial accounting and reporting. For auditing purposes, we cover related party transaction. And now you are seeing the same topic in tax. Simply put, what I'm trying to say is this. Related party transactions are important, whether you are reporting for financial accounting, auditing, or tax purposes. Now, what is considered related parties for tax purposes? For tax purposes, related parties can be any of the following. Members of your family, including brothers, sisters, have brothers, have sisters, spouse, ancestors, people above you, and lineal descendant, people below you. Above you means your parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren, etc. Also, if you own 50% or more in a partnership or a corporation, this becomes a related party transact related parties, whether that ownership is direct or indirect. Or if you control a tax exempt charitable a tax exempt charity or educational organization by you or any family member. Those are related party to you. Therefore, they could create a related party loss. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. Now, related party transaction under section 267, taxpayers are not allowed to deduct losses on related party transaction. However, if you generate gains, by all means, IRS loves it, you will pay taxes on that. Those are taxable. The losses are not allowed. The main reason for the IRS to disallow the losses is that, that the seller may retain some sort of a control over, over the sold property through his related party or her related party. So simply put, when you are transacting with the related party, the assumption is you control the other party. So you might be able to set the price and create the loss, or you might sell it and stay in control of the asset. So this is why related parties, they are looked at differently. Okay. Although taxpayers are not allowed to deduct the losses, when the related buyer subsequently sell the property, he or she recognizes gain only to the extent that he or she realizes the gain exceeds the previously disallowed loss. So once the other party, the buyer, sells it to a party other than the related party, it means an outside party, then the gain is recognized to the extent that the realized loss exceeds the previously disallowed loss if any, but will work an example. In other words, disallowed losses might be used to reduce the gain on a future disposition of the property to an unrelated party. So after you sell it, we might be able to use this loss. We will see in an example how it works. If the, if the property was subsequently sold to unrelated party at a loss, so it was initially at a loss, then you sold it again at a loss, the deduction of the loss is limited to the loss realized by the new seller. So you cannot use the loss that was disallowed originally between the related party. Your loss is the new loss. In other words, the taxpayer cannot use the previously disallowed loss to increase his or her recognized loss. Any remaining loss expires, expired, unused. Basically, it's done. The rules above apply to property used for business or investment. Remember, any loss from personal use property is treated as a personal loss 
and not disallowed altogether. Now, the best way to illustrate this is to look at an example. Adam sold property with an adjusted basis of 7,000 to his sister Marlin for 4,000. So the selling price was four, the adjusted basis is seven. Adam realized a loss of 3,000, that's the loss. However, the loss is disallowed because it's between related parties. After two months, Marilyn sold the property to unrelated party for nine. Now, how much did Marilyn pay for the party? Marilyn paid four, she sold it for 10. So 10 minus four, she had a gain from this of 5,000. Now, what she can do, she can use this unrecognized loss here and bring her gains down to 2,000. Well, she could bring the gain down to zero if need be, but no more than zero, okay? So so notice what happened, the $3,000 loss by Adam, this was this allowed, she was able to use it later on. Now let's talk about the holding period. The holding period for a property acquired from a, from a related party always begin on the date the property is acquired. So when you bought it, that new transaction, established the holding period, the start date of the holding period, regardless of the original owner holding period. So the new holding period start with the new transaction. This is important for determining the nature of the gain or the loss to be recognized on the subsequent disposition. Example, Susan sold the property to her brother Alex for 8,700, 8,700. Susan basis was 10,000. Well, as a result, Susan's going to have a loss of 1,300. Alex eventually sold the property to unrelated party for 12. For Alex, sold it for 12. Alex paid 8,700. Therefore, the difference between 12,000 and 8,700 is the gain. 12,000 minus 8,700 is the gain for Alex, which is 3,000. 300. This is a gain. Okay, now let's take a look at it. Determine the amount of the gain or the loss for Susan. For Susan, the loss is 1,300. However, this loss is this allowed. Now, on the other hand, the sale transaction performed by Alex is not related party. Again, initially it was 3,300. However, Alex can use the losses from Susan, which is 1,000. 300 and as a result his gain will go down to 2000 Alex recognizes gain is 2000 how could Susan have avoided the disallowed loss on the sale of the property how would you disallow the loss sell it to an outside party okay assuming this is not a personal use property which is that's what we're assuming sell it to unrelated party and Susan will be able to recognize the loss Assume now that Alex sold the property to unrelated party for 7,000. What is the amount of loss that Alex, Alex might deduct from the sale of this transaction? Now, assuming Alex, rather than 12,000, sold it for seven, he would incur a loss, and the loss will be for 1,700. Sold it for seven, purchased it from Susan for 8,700, it's 1,700. Again, assuming this is not a personal use property, in other words, we cannot tag on, we cannot add Susan's losses because also Susan incurred the loss. So we cannot add Susan's losses to the 1,700 that Alex is going to recognize. Assume that Alex sold the property to unrelated party now for 9,000. Determine the amount of gain or loss that Alex recognized. Again, let's take a look at it. 9,000 is the selling price. The adjusted basis for Alex is 8,700. The gain is 300. That's fine. Oh, the gain. I should not put the parentheses. The gain is 300. Now remember, Susan has disallowed losses that can be used. But the disallowed losses that Alex can use is limited to the 300. So this, the disallowed losses can only wipe out the 300 and cannot create additional losses for Alex. I'm not sure what was the original losses. What was the original losses for Susan? 1,300. So simply put, 1,000 of losses will go unexpired, basically gone. Susan the, the cannot use it. Alex cannot use it. It's basically expired. Now, another related party, another related topic, <laughs> related party, another related 
topic to related party transaction, tax avoidance, avoidance and imputed interest. So a little bit of a background about tax avoidance and imputed interest. Why does it exist? Think about an individual. Let's assume an individual has half a million dollar in cash sitting in the bank. If this individual, let's assume I have this money. And if I have this money and I invest this money, let's assume I bought stocks and bonds. And every year I make, just for the sake of illustration, I don't know, 10%, $50,000 in income from this 50000 investment income. Now, my tax, my tax bracket is 30%. So if I make 50000 in income, I have to pay 30%. Then my tax bill will be uh, 15000 That's my tax bill per year. Well, here's what people used to do in the past. They will take this half a million, give it to their kids. So for example, I'll transfer this money to my son. Let's assume I'll transfer it to Adam. And Adam will invest this money. And Adam's tax rate is 20%. Just we're making numbers up. In other words, Adam's tax rate is lower than mine. It doesn't matter. 20, 10, 15, lower than 30. Now Adam will pay, uh, if, well, we'll make 50,000 first. We'll make 50,000 profit. Adam will pay 20%. 20% is $10,000. So notice what happened is there's a tax savings of 5,000. And what would happen is I will have a loan against Adam. I would say, Adam, this, I, I'm lending you this money. Basically, I have a note against him where I can get my money back. So notice what happened here, lowering the tax bill. So the government starting, I believe, in the 80s, 1984, 1985, I don't remember the year, they said that's no longer acceptable. When you lend money to another related party, if it's below interest rate or no interest rate, interest will always be computed. So that's that's why it's called tax avoidance. You cannot avoid taxes and you have to compute what's called imputed interest. Okay. So taxpayers may try to avoid paying taxes to the IRS through transaction with related party. To prevent such attempts, the IRS imputes interest on the property sales transaction anytime credit are extended to an interest rate below the prevailing interest market rate. So we just talked about the loans between the father and the son or between family member. Also, you could have a transaction selling a property and not accounting for the interest component. Well, you have to always involve an interest component. As a result, individual taxpayers are required to report any foregone interest on a below market loan as an interest income. So if you charge someone below market or no interest, same concept. There is an interest. If you sold someone on credit, if you sold someone on installment, if they're going to pay you that money later, that's a form of a loan. And all loans would require you to compute interest part of it. Okay. Now, below market loans include gift loans, compensation related loans, loans between corporation and shareholders, tax avoidance loan, loan to qualified continuing care facilities, or any other below market loans. Gift loans, basically somebody giving you a gift as a loan, basically. Okay, here's $5,000, you can use it. It's a loan, it's a gift from me. Or compensated related loan, where the company loan you money to the employee. Or loans between corporation and shareholders, the corporation would lend you money or vice versa, you lend the corporation money, okay? Now, there are few limitations and exceptions we need to be aware of. It's worth noting that the imputed interest rules do not apply to any day on which the aggregate outstanding amount of gift, compensa compensation-related loans, loans between corporation and shareholder, equal or less than 10,000, okay? Assuming they don't buy income-producing property. If it's between individual, assuming even between individual or the other party, assuming they don't buy income-producing property. Simply put, if the loan is less than 10000 and assuming the other party don't buy income-producing property, then forget it. There is no interest. We don't have to worry about this. That's the first exception. In addition, if the outstanding amount of a gift loan is equal to or less than 100000 if the loan now more than 10000 but less than 100,000, the foregone interest to be included in the lender's income and deducted by the borrower may not exceed the borrower's net income, net investment income for that tax year. So if the amount is more than 10,000, less than 100,000, well, the amount of interest cannot exceed the borrower's net investment income. So if the borrower's net investment income is 5,000, that imputed interest cannot exceed that. It will be the lower. 
Moreover, if the net investment income reported by the by the borrower is less than a thousand, and if the if the borrower net investment income is less than a thousand, forget it. Then we will not have any 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 interest computed. Now all these rules, all these exceptions apply, assuming that the loan, the gift loan, is made for, for is is made is not made. That's an important word I missed. Is not made for the purpose of tax avoidance. Okay, if the loan is made for the purpose of tax avoidance, well, actually, I, I wrote it correct. If the loan is made for the purpose of tax avoidance, those limitations don't apply. So simply put, if you're making a loan to avoid paying taxes, just, you know, that, that's not allowed. Okay, so those rules don't apply. The best way to illustrate this is actually basically to look at a few examples. Now, how do we compute the foregone interest? The foregone interest is computed as the difference between the amount of interest accrued at the applicable federal rate, AFR, or simply put, the federal rate, assuming the interest was payable annually on December 31st and the amount of interest actually payable on the loan for the same period. Let's take a look at a simple example. Maggie loaned her mother, Emily, $100,000 payable in five years at an annual rate at 0.5. Determine Maggie's imputed interest income, assuming the federal rate, by the IRS for long-term loan is 2.5. Maggie's charging her mother 0.5, but she should charge her 2.5. Well, the difference is imputed interest. So 100,000 times the difference between 2.5 and 5, which is 2%, Maggie would have to include in her income an additional $2,000. Let's take a look at this comprehensive example to illustrate the limitation. Assuming for this example, the federal rate is 10% and it's computed semi-annually. We have five situations starting with Adam. Adam is the borrower. Adam borrowed $8,500. Adam's net investment income is zero. He doesn't have net investment income and the purpose for the loan is education. Well, guess what? It's less than 10,000. We don't have to worry about anything. No imputed interest is computed. And also Adam is not buying income producing property. Maggie borrowed 9,300. The borrower net investment income is 500. Maggie's net investment income is 500. She purchased a bond, income producing property. Well, the amount is less than 10,000, but it's to purchase an income producing property. But, but since her net investment income is less than 1,000 and the loan is less than 100,000, no imputed interest. So the $10,000 limit does not apply because she's, she's buying a bond. However, under the $100,000 exception, since her net investment income is less than $1,000, the government says it's immaterial, don't worry about it. Mary borrowed $25,000. Her bo borrowing net investment income is zero to purchase a business. Guess what? $100, less than $100,000, the $100,000 exception apply. George borrowed $95,000. The borrower net investment income is 15 to buy a home. Now we have less than 100,000 and we have more than 1,000 but less than 100,000 but we have net investment income of 15,000. What do we have to do for George? Well, we have to compute the, 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 the compute the interest and it has to be, we're gonna, the interest imputed is the lesser of 15,000 and the interest computed using the federal rate. So it's gonna be, 95,000 times 10% times one half, which is because the interest is computed semi-annually, that's 4,750. 99,750 times 10% times one half or 612, $4,987.50. The total interest imputed is $9,737.50. Now, Farhat, the amount of the loan is 130,000. It doesn't matter. We stop. It's more than 100. We're going to impute the interest. 100,000 times 10% times one half. Let's go back to the slide. So for Farhat, 130,000 times 10% times one half, that's 6,500. Then we're going to take this amount, since it's semi-annually, add it to the 130. It's going to be 136,500 times 10% times one half. Say one half and 612 are the same because the interest is semi-annually. That's 6,825. The interest is six, and total imputed interest, 13,325 because it does not really matter. It's above 100,000. We don't have to worry about 
the borrower net investment income. So I hope this illustration kind of consolidated the knowledge about imputed interest. What should you do now? Go to Farhat Lectures, whether you are a CPA, EA, or an accounting student, farhatlectures.com, to look at additional resources that is, that's going to help you understand this topic. Good luck. Study hard. Stay safe.